what's what's the hope and what's the realism around what you've seen doing multiple clients already? So I can honestly say without a shadow of a doubt, first of all, there is hope for everyone out there. Anytime someone reaches out with me with this kind of PFS based issue, there's hope. There really is. I mm -hmm. believe that everyone can get back to at least 80 to 90 percent to meet anyone, no matter who you are. It may take some time. The patience factor is what really has to come into play, but 80 to 90 percent is applicable for everyone. What's up, everyone? It's Russo. I hope everyone is doing well here with Grandmaster Kikul, the only guy, in my opinion, to fully figure out PFS, post lines, main, post SSSSSSRI. Everyone gets mad. I put too many S's in there. And you're like the only one who actually take it seriously. I have given you the thumb of approval as far as like, I know Kikul has this figured out more than anyone else. And that's after reading everything on the internet. All the forms went through all the garbage data collected. I've Excel spreadsheets of like 150 recoveries, what they did. And it pretty much leads back to Kiko's way of figuring out the disease. Kiko, why do you think this is like the most brushed under the rug type of disease I've ever seen? Like, let alone have it. Like, I guess it's very hard to conceptualize and believe because so many people are completely healthy taking accutane and they can get away with antidepressants but for these few unlucky people it seems like you know i'm treated like a crazy person online it's my bipolar i've never had you know i didn't crash at all from the mushroom product it's not that like where did you see like oh this is a real thing and i'm gonna read into this so first of all you give me way too much credit you really really are so i'll put that out there first uh second of all if we look at where I started in bodybuilding and then evolved into powerlifting, strongman, general population, dysfunctional coaching, you start seeing a wide array of drug metabolism consequences or drug metabolism uh, results. Once you start seeing people getting uh, tremors and people having actual hallucinations off of 10 milligrams of Trenblone or taking a Tylenol and having a faux stroke kind of heart attack type thing, or getting you know, COVID as a good example, and having heart failure, mm -hmm. you start realizing drug metabolism and supplement metabolism, it's all the same thing. It's so drastically different from person to person. There's that biological inter-individuality that makes it so, I hate when people say like, oh, we're a special snowflake. We kind of are. I have IFB mm -hmm. pros, for example, that can take a gram of trend and their EGFR goes from 75 to 106. Autonomics improve, mm -hmm. you know? I also have the same person who can go ahead and they'll take you know, whatever, baby aspirin, and they will get, their blood will get so thin that they'll bleed out if they get a cut. So drug mm. metabolism changes from general population to dysfunctional to athletes. So that's the first thing. Then you break it apart into genders. Then you break it apart even further into the person, uh, the interpersonal mm. based changes. So we have a wide array of changes and then you start seeing these weird things pop up. I remember PFS first kind of hit my radar was actually post Accutane. So for the sake of this call, we're going to say PFS, it's going to be Accutane, wine, right, everything. Right, right. It'll, yeah. It's just too much. Um, but it started mm -hmm. off with Accutane. If you look at Accutane and some of the original research from there, it really does the big negative consequence because everyone likes to say hepatotoxicity, and it's not that bad. You compare it to traditional oral androgens, not the end of the world. What it really does good, though, in a bad way, is it starts to atrophy your prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex-wise, the things that has that dopamine serotonergic relationship we can start to metabolize those neurotransmitters and we start changing how we form habits. That's important to understand because everything we do is a habit. Every second we're alive, every second we're interpreting information like we're talking right now, mm -hmm. your brain's going. Your brain's trying to pick up on what am I saying? Is it important? Should I store it in long-term memory? Should I kind of just get rid of it? Mm -hmm. It's all based on dopamine and serotonin-based relationship in the prefrontal cortex. What Accutane does is it atrophies the prefrontal cortex pretty significantly depending on the person though because not everyone gets that mm -hmm. negative side effect. It also screws up dopaminergic transmission. So not just ligand of dopamine getting to receptor, binding to receptor, and the ultimate signal sent from it. It screws up that entire cascade along with multiple other things. So I was introduced to it with Accutane. Then came the finasteride-based people. And I started going back because I love looking through patents and all that kind of crap. And if you know how to find it on the internet, it's really interesting because you can find everything out there, which is really, really cool. Um, I started looking at the original documents from when finasteride first came onto the market. And if you understand what's going on, all of these negative side effects were reported on. They all have the yeah. actual, like, yeah, I'm sure you know, 
Um, yep. They were all reported on. They were swept under the rug. And then people started coming out about it saying, hey, I was part of this research. I'm not okay with this. They basically fired them, had them sign NDAs, all that kind of crap. Right. And then recently, over the past five, ten years or so, it's starting to kind of come out. No, five years. It's starting to kind of come out. But it's been known about forever. But if it was originally put on the label, and they changed the label. I forget the verbiage they used. But they added suicide to the label. They had to add suicide. Yep. And then I believe finasteride is actually banned in France as we speak. Yep. So again... You have this, all these people who use it to keep their hair, their hair's everything, and all vanity biohacking, like seeing that it's been banned in one country. And then you have those people that have been suffering called a lunatic. You know, they're, they're, they're coming at each other hard, like you said, the past five years. And see, I think that's so wrong because there's no bad drug. There's just people using drugs in the wrong way or the fact that you're just not a candidate for that drug. Right. The problem with that though is if you don't have the information, like if you don't know that this is a potential side effect and you take it, just thinking, oh, I don't want to use any other drugs, I just want to keep my hair nice, then you could potentially be screwed for the rest of your life. But there's literally how many other people that take finasteride or lion's mane or accutane and they're completely fine. They see none of these negative mm. side effects. So I'm not someone who's like against finasteride or any drug or I'm pro. I'm based on the person. You know what I mean? It can be awesome for certain people, the worst thing for others. So to me, though, that's kind of where it really all started. Um, going back to the patents, getting introduced to that, helping people with post-Accutane first, then post spin then all of a sudden Lion's Mane. Lion's Mane's an interesting one. And tell me to shut up, by the way, if you want me to, because I could just go off on tangents. But with Lion's No, 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 no. Uh, I want your authentic, your authentic out there, for sure. Well, this is me. I usually talk fast when I get excited, so try and slow it down. Um, lion's Mane. Look at the whole fruiting body. So traditional Lion's Mane. Break it up. There's all the terpenes and things. But the main mm -hmm. one we're looking at are the hericinones and the arinocins. So hericinone, I believe it's the D actual variation. That's the one that has a lot of the 5R base change, 5AR base changes. Um, so that side of lion's mane is kind of seen as the DHT cascade. We can modulate things over there, and that's what causes the post-lion's mane syndrome. The arinocin, though, does not cause that. That causes all the NGF stuff. So before this call, we were talking about nerve growth factor. There's products mm -hmm. out there that are not whole fruiting body of lion's mane, but just arinocin products. So we can take the mm -hmm. arinocin to get more NGF. We take, like we talked about, the tiger's milk to get more NGF. Mm -hmm. We do other things to get more NGF because we're trying to drive up neurogenesis this entire process. Then you start talking about, and I'll stop for a second, but that's where we get into like ARA 290 and other things with nerve regeneration mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but yeah, lion's mane was really because of the herinocin D content and some of the, maybe some other herinocins in there, but not the herinocins. There's a big difference with that. So go into, well, well, Kiko always goes to like most advanced, yeah, like sorry. right off the bat. And like, again, this audience, I don't know how many people followed Kiko down his rabbit hole. It's like amazing that you can spit into that to that finite of a detail. But let's rewind to your recoveries. You know, a lot of coaches don't take on recoveries. They downplay them. They scam them, collect money off them. You have sat with some of your clients for, you know, months, years and you have really done the due diligence and helped battle with them as far as the recoveries. I have a lot of guys DMing me wanting to hire you and I still put my stamp of approval of like, you know what's going on, you know the multiple ways to get you out, but you gotta fight out yourself. How have you seen that play out multiple times for, I don't know, you go into those forms, it's hopeless, you know, the foundation that collected money off my channel and then once i started healing you know retract it back you know oh, really they they, they want to they want to keep it like you can't cure out cure out of it it seems wow. like you've made some 100 percent recoveries and it's looking like as long as i turn my legs back on i'm, I'm pretty much back to normal That's where awesome. we have other people suffering for decades you know i met a guy who kept crashing back down for I think 15 years. I'll have Andrew throw up a picture of his before and after, just a skeletor. So how have the recoveries been? Like what's what's the hope and what's the realism around what you've seen doing multiple clients already? So I can honestly say without a shadow of a doubt, first of all, there is hope for everyone out there. Anytime someone reaches out with me with this kind of PFS based issue, there's hope. There really is. I mm -hmm. believe that everyone can get back to at least 80 to 90%. To me, anyone, no matter who you are, it may take some time. The patience factor is what really has to come into play. But 80 to 90% is applicable for everyone. You can get there. 100% is a little bit harder, 
but still, I want to say, what, 90, 95%? Like, it's still a really high percentage. The problem with most people is that when they come to me, they are so down. Almost everyone is suicidal. Mm -hmm. And like, dude, ever since I started having kids, I got soft, man. I feel for everyone. Someone tells me they're feeling suicidal mm -hmm. and I want to be the daddy bear. I want to help you. I want to make sure you're feeling good. So mm -hmm. it's become like a combination of being a friend, being a therapist, and being a coach. And I feel like if you don't have those three things with fixing this kind of problem, you're almost not going to get there because you need to have that. You need to have that hope and the light at the end of the tunnel. Usually the way these syndromes work, you start off initially, they usually get a little bit worse because most people are doing nothing. They're not training. Mm -hmm. They are barely eating. They are depressed. Work is going terribly, usually not in a relationship. It's just usually terrible, right? Mm -hmm. Start to introduce all these things. Exercise comes back in. Things start to get moving back on. We start tracking nutrition. We add in supplements, pharmacology, whatever we need for that specific person. And it gets worse. It's like the worst like week, two weeks, maybe even three. But then all of a sudden coming towards the end of like week three, maybe four, you hear something like, I had a decent week, you know, got happy for the first time in a while, but you know, I still want to get this fixed quick. And I go, mm -hmm. you've been depressed and unhappy for 10 years. You told me you've never been happy in 10 years. You were just happy for like three hours. That's a mm. positive sign. It's going to keep slowly getting better from there. And it's slowly feeling better. People want to wake up overnight and have it all better. It doesn't work like that with these kind of syndromes. It's the slowly, all of a sudden, you realize, you see a girl walking on the street and you go, oh, you kind of turn your head, right? Or you have right. some kind of nocturnal erection or just having that mental arousal because mental arousal has to start first before that genital reaction can occur. So before you can actually get an erection as a male, and we'll talk about this later, but PFS, the differences between males and females, because no one talks about the female side of this at all. Right. PSSD is another big thing. And I saw you post your female recovery. You know, that's a whole different segment on YouTube that's blowing yeah. up. I'm kind of like, obviously, with the drama of finasteride, but a lot of women for those in the audience, you know, their clit completely loses function. Yeah. And after one pill of a antidepressant for some people. It's crazy too with that kind of syndrome and I'll, we'll go on to it in a different video. But if you look at the architecture of an actual, you know, actual penis based genitalia and then that vaginal kind of clitoral uh, genitalia, it looks like a smaller version of a penis. If you actually look at the architecture, mm -hmm. you have those little vestibular bulbs, you have the little clitoris up here, you have all the clitoral based tissue going into the body internally. And for males, it's just external, bigger testicular action, obviously then big chunk of the penis. It's the same mm -hmm. thing, just in different sizes and internal versus external. So the problems are similar. They all begin with a dopaminergic cascade that initiate that arousal-based response. Then there's some changes from males to females. There has to be hemodynamic flow because got to get blood down into your genitals. And for the women, it's that entire vulva, that whole vaginal bowl. They take about like 20 to 30 minutes to get enough blood flow into that area if they're completely natural. Enhance different conversation. Males, you can get an erection in like 30 seconds depending on who you are. Right. So there's big differences yeah. there. Where did you, because when I first got it, right, you had all these opinions weighing in and I kept saying that my androgen receptors, it seemed like, you know, for whatever reason, I've never felt like that in my entire life. And my dick was essentially burned off at one point, like discolored, burned off. And they kept saying it wasn't the androgen receptor. Turns out it was the androgen receptor. What led you towards the androgen receptor? Because obviously I went to that charity. I saw what they were researching. They were at the androgen receptor level and I didn't know exactly what was wrong with the androgen receptor. I assumed that maybe my body multiplied androgen receptors based on trying to reconfigure the neuro cascades that are blocked from the allopregnanolone not being at the level that I personally need as a bipolar person. But like, where did that lead you towards like, okay, this is the root cause. Because if you think it's just neurosteroids, you're like, oh, just inject HCG, HMG, wait it out. You're being impatient. No, I feel like I didn't make any progress until those androgen receptors were dealt with. I don't think that androgen receptor overexpression is the root problem. I think it's all at the same level. It's more so going from person to person of, is there more AR damage? Or is there more neurological based damage? Because even though they sound the same, they're not. So obviously, AR is everywhere in our body, you know, erectile tissue, brain based tissue, literally everywhere. 
What I see happen with ARs specifically is you have an overexpression, so we have that multiplication of multiple entrants, which by the way changes the more hypermuscular you are, which is why it seems like you probably had a lot more. In yeah, go go into go into that because like when people think AR overexpression, you know, like you think logically like, oh, that's good. Like go into like how it becomes a dysfunction. Yes, yes. Be okay, so. As you build more muscle tissue, which is as a fine example, um, muscle tissue gets bigger. Architecturally, think of them as foam poles. They have to be set up to cover more land, right? So as you have more antigen receptors, more muscle tissue kind of goes hand in hand. As antigen load goes up, muscle tissue goes up, and androgen receptor level goes up. So the number of receptors goes up. So okay, we get that, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, for whatever reason, with post-fin, lion's mane, all the fun stuff, it's causing a downregulation in the receptor's capacity to not only function, but also increase its ability to, to actually multiply. So you don't have to be, I have to be pro size to be getting all these new receptors. So what starts happening is people get more receptors, but they're more non-functional receptors. So now mm -hmm. ligand drug hormone can't come in, it can't find the receptor. So we have poor binding affinity. Then it's not able to dock properly, you know, cause that, that, that actual uh, GMAT mm -hmm. change and then send its signal. And so now we have a ligand a hormone that's just sitting there, can't bind, can't do anything because there's all these non-functional receptors going on. And you can go into it, it's, I, I made a video on this, it's really my best guess, but it's kind of playing out to. I watched your video. Yeah, yes, yeah, so the AB. I, 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 think, I think there is a specific finasteride study that backs exactly what you're talking about. I could see if Andrew can find it, but that exact mutation, again, is discovered and they use Proviron, but I use Proviron first didn't work at all you go in the forms i tried proviron shut up you can't heal out of it <laughs> dihydroboron was a different story because you can scale it with the serum concentration yep. for someone with my amount of mass to start you know fighting back against that and that's exactly it so the reason why dhb works so well and some people can get away with master or primo ball and has to be the dht derivative but if we look at dhb specifically dhb tremblone mint everyone sees those as the more powerful androgens right they're more powerful because they have a high amount of intrinsic efficiency. What that means in pharmacological terms is its ability to drug find a receptor, dock, send signal. The signal it sends in that docking stage, that transmission stage, is 10 times, 20 times, whatever arbitrary number you want to put there, above what mm -hmm. testosterone is, above what mandrolone is. Those drugs drive such a higher chemical signaling cascade. We need that. Because what we need to do in this scenario is overwhelm the receptor while also right. the receptor. So we're trying to fix it from an upstream and a downstream problem. So architecturally improve receptor and then have so much drug, it's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's the big hurdle is the people who recover out naturally because there are people who can recover out naturally. I assume like I want, well, the brain comes back online and everything slowly goes back to normal. But if you have that AR issue, I feel like that's where they go to the doctor and they're like, Oh, you might just be depressed, you know, put them on antidepressant. They don't have any which way to even combat that, which, again, puts a spotlight on people like you thinking outside the box. I don't think there's going to be. Do you think there's going to be a one size fits all treatment like in 15 years for this? Because based on everyone DMing me about their personal issues with this, it seems to be all over the board of how the syndrome occurs to each individual like you started in the beginning of this conversation. I don't think there's ever going to be a, a one size fits all drug that's going to cure all the problems because you're looking at multiple different variant problems occurring. And then you have other variants within those variants. So it could be overall anti receptor problem, but maybe the binding affinity is fine. Maybe it's just a receptor problem. So then if you go ahead and you take this one size fits all drug, it could be fixing a problem that's not there, hyper regulate that cascade. And all of a sudden, what's that going to do if it's like a DHB type equation? That could be overexpression of a DHT side of things. And all of a sudden, hair starts falling out, you get all the other negative side effects that are close enough to PFS, mm -hmm. kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So I don't think there's ever gonna be like a one pill or one drug, I hope there is, that'd be awesome. Um, right. I don't think so. Do you think there would be like, theoretically a $25,000 RNA shot where they have it all targeted and boom? Like that, that's literally, again, I'm just going into what the yeah. cult is like proposing, collecting 200,000 plus, plus euros you know for these studies they, they're thinking like chroma medicine you know chroma medicine they're thinking like that direction personally having this dealing with this 
like you said it is impacting all sorts of things and like you kind of just work on it like a jigsaw puzzle and slowly try to get out of it you think there's any merit to chroma being able to i mean this drug would be super expensive if they did it i already see people getting gene editing it's like 15 to 25 grand a shot so yeah i don't think so so this is coming from my experience working with people in the nfl nhl in the olympic level where gene editing is done all the time stem cell therapy with myostatin deletion is done all the time like we can literally create these athletes and these human beings to be what we want them to be. Um, so mm -hmm. understanding that background, I don't see the same application happening with PFS or these kinds of syndromes, not only because they're multifaceted, but if we relate to like a cancer, there being multiple different kinds of cancer. Like I've helped people go through chemotherapy, come out or come off chemotherapy and literally destroy their cancer with a cool little drug called PNC-127. No one talks about that drug. It kills cancer cells. Not all cancer cells, but breast cancer, testicular cancer, things like that. But it still only works better if thymosin alpha-1 is in play. And it works even better if glutathione is in play. So no matter what therapy's out there, because even with the gene editing and things like that, like the stem cell therapy, you don't do senescent cell work beforehand, you're getting like 50% of the action. And sometimes that's not enough to show enough of a result. So to me, I, I hope there's a monotherapy at one point. I hope that that shot comes out, but there's gonna most likely have to be steps before that done as well. So I, even in that scenario, it's not just a take this shot and you're gonna be good. It's gonna be, you have to prepare for the shot and then potentially recover from the shot depending on what's going on from a gene editing aspect. Go into your direct timeline on average you see of someone who's like, you know, obviously we talked about people are helpless, they ignore the problem, they don't work out, they don't eat right, they let the emotional bullshit get to them. And like, I was in a state of terror, like postpartum, like that, that's what it felt like. If you like, can't wrap your head around, like this is what's going on. I'm in this state of terror and you let it eat you alive. Like if someone was like, no, I'm going to fight out of it. People, other people have healed out of it. Like, how do you see that timeline playing out for the average victim watching this? Average person four to six months. Usually that's like the average recovery. I have some guys now we're going on a year and we're like at 90%, 95, just can't get, quite get to 100. Other people get to 90% and be like, I'm cool, I'm done messing with this, I just wanna stay here forever and not have to risk anything else. The really hyper responders are the people that took it one time, you know, literally after the first dose, within hours. Just, yeah, exactly, yeah. Literally like 40 minutes I knew I was fucked. Yeah. It's and I've done all these psychedelics and everything, I'm like, I am fucked. And how long have you been having this for? Um, I'm going on nine months. Oh, Jesus. So usually people in your situation, you're like three months-ish if it's like a one-time dose. So Dude, the castration it. was, I pissed like dark orange. Yeah. For like, two, like I pissed all my muscle off. Like I knew my AR were destroyed. Have you done any red light therapy directly on your penis? No, not okay. yet. So that's a big one. Um, it's ability of that red light photonic exchange to traverse that penile based tissue. So making the mitochondrial mm -hmm. changes and you have a hemodynamics so get more blood flow, more recovery. Yeah, I actually have people do that, maybe take a little bit of oxytocin beforehand and start watching mm -hmm. kind of an adult video that like used to turn them on if they can't actually get aroused mm -hmm. anymore. We're trying to attack the neurological, the hemodynamic and the oxytocin cascade. And a little bit of dopamine in there as well from the oxytocin because that has to happen to go downstream and drive that actual erection process. But I think you I think your recovery would be right if I did combat right off the bat with the AR because the first three months, oh, you have an autoimmune thing, you know, you it just gets blamed on all these other things where Oh, so you, you know had, a lot of people She had first three months of nothing, you didn't even know what the problem was. I thought it would like my I had a butterfly face, my histones were completely trashed, no digestion, you know, it yeah. was definitely from you know the ground up trying to figure out and then everyone around me doesn't really believe in pfs to the level it actually is if you experience it where you know someone like you actually takes it seriously so it was a lot of that in the beginning but after the dhb i feel like six months is pretty realistic my last question for my recovery personally is my central nervous system strength like goes up at like maybe i can push a little bit harder two percent three percent each workout yo-yo effect yeah. 
I come in there with more. I assume allopregnanolone is the chemical that's responsible for the contraction of my muscles. You also mentioned that it was a neuron gate. Nerve growth factor. You told me about carnitine for reactivating what's. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need the excitation. So carnitine would go ahead and start driving the androgen receptor and the androgen binding affinity constant changes. So carnitine oh, okay. would fix the actual reception receptor based problem. And then from there, the choline addition to that would go ahead and start driving that excitation process. Because like we said before, you're trying to, you know, crawl, walk, right. run type thing. So you're trying to rebuild that nervous system, but not get too sympathetic. You get too sympathetic and it kind of starts having the downward cascades where you start to kind of regress from a learning aspect. Mm -hmm. So you think just like slowly yo-yo all the way back out. Do you have any other tips? So we talked about quarantine colon injections daily. Um, mm -hmm. A nerve growth factor donor in there is only going to help. So again, like a tiger milk mushroom, uh, 300 milligrams, nootropics depot. They have so many awesome little products that everyone doesn't have. They also have that Arenison A product. Uh, so the lion's mane, I wouldn't do that for you just because you're so close to recovery. Even though it's the heuristic yeah, yeah, in there, yeah. it's like the paranoia. Yeah, the paranoia, just don't risk yeah. it. Um, if you were in the beginning, I'd definitely say an Arenison A based product, but you're not there. So we have Tiger's Milk, we have the Carnitine Choline based product. Um, Livigen wise, I know you mentioned you started taking that, right? Where are you at with that? I did, yeah. It definitely, like, you feel the baseline go down as a Livigen comes out for sure it's just like when i read into dosing of livigen it's like you know i don't know how to dose it i don't know if like am i is it scalable upwards or am i just wasting it i guess i what'd you dose it upwards of i just went crazy and like did a vial on each leg like just like i had no idea yeah, yeah. so um so i'm a bigger fan of understanding the process and then trying to dose according to that we're making epigenetic changes that takes a while so I right. literally like for most spread it out. Exactly. Yeah. If you're literally like 100, 200 micrograms every day sub Q before bed, do something like that. Give that. Okay. That might take two months, three months, four months, but it's really going to add up. And then once it's done, you can drop it and never use it again because you made those epigenetic changes. The big boluses aren't going to come into play. It's not like a TB500 or PPC157. You can get some massive uh, non-genomic action immediately. This is a more genomic long-term chronic play. Okay. All right, yeah, it worked though. That that definitely like for those suffering, that moved the needle a lot. Like when I went into the gym, I could feel my contractions again, and I could still walk after the gym. Good. You know, I, people don't people don't think it's like think I'm crazy. Like where I have to like sit down after leaving the gym. Like go into like how the CNS depletes to a point where like it's not in my head. You know how like oh, first yeah. you're like, oh, this is in my head. And then you start psyching yourself out. And then it's like, oh man, no, I actually have to sit down. Like I'm about to crash type. You know, one thing COVID did really good is that it brought more awareness to depression and neurological based disorders. When people say it's all in your head, everything's in your head. If we didn't have our neurological tissue, then our actually our heart would keep being on by itself um, with sinus rhythm, but everything else isn't gonna work. So everything starts with neurological tissue and bleeds downstream from there. If you don't have a good neurological capacity, you're not gonna learn. If you can't learn, that means you can't learn new habits or break old bad habits. So if you're cheating on your girlfriend or wife all the time, you're gonna keep doing that because you don't realize, oh, this is bad. You can't break that bad mm. habit because you don't have the right neurochemistry in place. If you're the person who, whatever, beats up, like whatever bad habit, it's all neurochemically driven. So yes, it's technically all in your head, but technically everything's in your head. So. We get that negative connotation out of the way. What we start looking at here is an issue of overall neurotransmitter production and acetylcholine levels. So most people end up having this acetylcholine debt to where if you think about acetylcholine, it's like brain food. So let's just say calories for, for myological muscle tissue and acetylcholine for the brain. It's obviously not like that because our brain uses like 20% of our food um, every day. But acetylcholine is going to be the main driver to drive everything. So we have acetylcholine in there. We have dopamine, serotonin, which helps with so many cascades, but we'll just say mainly habit formation, learning, things like that. They have all these other cortical regions that use maybe a little bit of epinephrine, maybe a little bit of norepinephrine. It's this whole neurochemical soup that has to all be in tandem. The problem is mm -hmm. tandem for you is different than tandem for me. So you said you have bipolar disorder. So for you, where are you at right now with dopamine? Where are you at right now with serotonin and everything? How do you respond? So yeah, yeah, I can have a full normal mania. You know, I can roll a mania. Like if I stick my mind in the mania, I can roll it for two days where it, it used to run out. Like it used to deplete. I used to exit the mania. 
it seems like again my dopamine is very strong it seems like the aloe or whatever offsets it the gaba i'm not like a big neurochem guy whatever is offsetting the dopamine was again running out way faster but like i can get mental arousal just thinking with thoughts now and yep. everything's pretty normal besides you know my legs they don't like i had massive bodybuilder legs probably my only body part that was like close to pro level and they will not reinflate at all um have you started doing any neuroplastic work as you get to this 90 percent recovery if you're not already doing something even as simple as like the elevate app five daily games every day that's going to help uh, okay. massively um we have that uh protocol i give to everyone one of them is a specific writing based drill so the reason why in 2023 most people are losing their iqs or at least the nationwide average is going down is because no one everyone types and everyone types in fragmented sentences it's never a well thought out sentence and also no one's writing no one's writing in cursive anymore when you write in cursive that non-stop motion has to use both hemispheres of your brain starts firing those right cortical regions so if you start every day off with whatever nootropic or whatever you know your brain health supplements are for the day um we can go to like some speech work so you take a word with a high amount of syllables i usually use nuopep right and phenylacetyl i'll probably glycine ethyl ester repeat them multiple times and phenylacetylopolyglycinethylester, mm -hmm. and phenylacetylopolyglycinethylester. You keep doing that multiple, multiple times, start activating some cortical, um, that auditory cortex based region. We're trying to basically, with the law of locality, fire one area to get up all the areas activated. After you do that speech drill, go ahead, do your writing drill, get a journal, write about, you know, whatever positive things are going on in your life, something happy or whatever. You can also just do like your favorite song lyric or something like that. Couple lines in cursive, do your elevate app game. You could do that while you have your red light therapy on your head so you're getting some extra mm. version of the mitochondria changes uh neurologically and that's going to be a big change because neurological tissue is just like myological tissue you don't curl for your biceps they're not going to grow for most people you don't use your brain actively it's not going to grow it's not going to rehypertrophy so most people in this pfs based world have atrophied their brain so much that you can take these supplements and drugs and get some action, but if you don't start really making those plastic-based changes, the structural and architectural-based changes, it's never going to get better. It's just like, again, building your muscle tissue just for your brain. Do you think cerebral – I've tried cerebral lysin along yep. the path of this. And this. In this stage of my recovery, do you think that would be worth $150? Not this stage in your recovery. Okay. Love cerebral lysin. To me, that's like the one-time yearly player – Someone that has dementia. I actually just stopped someone. We reversed someone's uh, dementia. It was getting early stages, so it was super simple, actually. Um, took a while, but we used cerebral lysin for an extended period of time at very, very high dosages. That's the scenario for cerebral lysin. If you're using okay. cerebral lysin multiple times per year, you're usually doing more harm than good because you're not allowing that adaptation process to occur. So just like with muscle tissue, brain has to damage, grow. Damage, grow. Mm -hmm. Damage, grow. It's the same type thing. Um, maybe... Uh, so if we're thinking about your scenario, and again, I don't know your whole scenario. Uh, forgive me, I haven't followed you. At, uh, yeah, no, no worries. I just follow my wife on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I like that. I like um, that. Senescent self. People the low-key underrated. Yeah, I mean, it's just, just like my life so much, I don't need to venture off into the internet for it, you know? Um, I don't blame you. But, okay, so uh, senescent cell-wise, have you done any kind of research into that with your current problems? I have not read into that at all. Okay, cool. So what can happen again, you do all this damage to your body and the process of autophagy starts to go down. So obviously when we start programming the kind of dysfunctional cells to kill themselves off, so we can have autophagy here, go to apoptosis over here. So that damaged cell now kills itself off. But as autophagy gets upregulated, it can go down here and go through that senescent transition. So now we have what we call these zombie cells, which are sitting there, not just doing nothing, but also going off and causing damage in other places. I usually find that people at the end of 90% recovery-ish with PFS, that it's more of a senescent cell problem because although we fixed a lot of the problems, we fixed the genes, didn't fix a lot of the cells. We fixed some of the cells, but not all of them. Those senescent mm. cells, those zombie cells are sitting here going off and causing damage in your quads or hamstrings or whatever the problem is for you specifically, we need to actually drive that process and to get those senescent cells out to go back up to that cascade, go through autophagy again and actually drive apoptosis and kill it off. Um, super simple little thing. You can do uh, MOTC, so mitochondrial open reading frame of the 12th that's on RNAc. Don't need that for you since you're at this end. We're kind of trying to get it out quick. Um, right. The macrolide uh, azithromycin. So those macrolides are usually the ones used for antibacterial problems. Um, 
mainly works via inhibition of that uh, bacterial 50S ribosomal subunit, right? So that's how we take care of gut-based problems, maybe C. diff, whatever. What this does, though, is azithromycin specifically will drive that senescent cell apoptosis. So as autophagy is going up, drive senescent cell apoptosis and kind of recycle that and actually cause it to kill itself off. 500 milligrams, three days, usually has a lot of good. Takes usually a week or two weeks to kind of... Uh, actualize a lot of its benefits, but it'll start driving that process up pretty well. Awesome. I want to close out. Like, what are your closing thoughts? Because again, thank you for coming on all the people watching. Like you can scour the internet all you want. You won't find what Kiko just explained through this recovery at this level of detail. So hopefully you consult with him because I don't really see another coach again. I got all the coaches for free. Everyone coming at me for free. So I know everyone's thoughts and angles and everything. And I can say for a fact that Kiko has it down to his science, but it's a fight. What are your, what are your closing thoughts on? Cause like, this is the most hopeless. Like I was placed here because, you know, I'm not going to sit around. Like I built my whole empire. Like you built your empire. It's like, Oh, I'm dead. Like castrated off of one dosing of this product. Like, I'm going to continue on, yeah. you know, like a lot of people they they don't know what to do, you know, like they're, they're defeated within three weeks of that. And like you said, that brain atrophy is no joke. And I've suffered from that brain. Like my girlfriend's dated me for 10 years and she's like, you're like literally a vegetable for those first three months. So that sucks. Yeah. I, I think first step. Most people in this PFS based world, I find don't want to take any more drugs. They're usually natural or just on TRT and tried finasteride one time or did a course of Accutane and coming off had problems or whatever variation in between. I think the acceptance to understand that yes, you can recover naturally. Um, I just had a guy recover over just using some basic over the counter supplements took a lot longer, still recovered. Um, if you can accept that using, if, if this problem is caused by a drug, you most likely have to take drugs to fix it. So I feel like most people, you can accept that, hey, I'm going to take these specific drugs. I'm going to start driving this recovery. It's not, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I'm going to start seeing small little glimmers of hope. Play that out and then understand you can slowly work off of everything whenever you're done. I feel like that acceptance has to come first. For number one, I'm going to get better. It has to be your mentality where you can't right. and take it. Or, yeah. you know, you can't, what's the old phrase? You can take the donkey to water, can't make him drink. Or maybe it's horse, whatever. Yeah, you can't take the horse to water and make him drink. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or the fox, since I saw one earlier. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so first, accept that you're, you're not going to take this. And number two, if you want to happen faster, you're going to have to accept some drug use. Maybe not have to blast like crazy, but certain people, I've had a lot of people where they were completely natural, Again, of course, if an astride, actine, whatever, and we did push their dosage up pretty high right out of the gate, but three months later, they're done. They're back to being natural. Maybe they're just on some HCG or whatever, maybe nothing. Right. That yeah, that's fine. You're not going to be on everything forever because my protocols for a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff in there to buy. Like, I feel bad giving it to people, but I also want them to see results sooner rather than later to give them some hope. Once you, once you have that first day where you're like, I feel, I feel happy, I feel excited. I get like a half an erection. I get that little half chub. Like that's so yeah. much hope. So although it's more expensive to do it that way, I feel like if you can accept those three things, you're going to make it most likely have to take drugs. It's going to be expensive. I think that kind of gets the ball moving in the right direction. Awesome. Well, if you have any more in detail questions about your personal situation, obviously the prep is where you're going to go to contact Kiko and pay for his time because he just gave you a ton of freebies Nobody in this space is giving freebies like that as far as actual treatments. Sure, everyone will touch on, oh, pop some Proviron, take a little DHT powder and some NMN, and you're good. You know, that, that's all I needed, apparently. You know, that's I, I got to come in. I, I got to come in real quick and just say every coach has something to offer. Everyone in the world has something to offer. We're not talking down on any coaches. You know me, I'm drama free. Everyone has something to offer. Certain people may just have better skill sets or lesser skill sets or whatever. But I truly I just think, you know, this isn't taken seriously and you took it extremely seriously. Like it comes down to like some of the other coaches. Oh no, everything pharma dynamics of all this other shit that they just don't even want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. You're like the crazy guy who's like, yeah, I'm gonna touch it with a 10 foot pole and figure it out to like the basis of it. 
that's that's the difference between you that is a big difference between you it's fun to problem solve it really is you know i get a list of we have all these disorders all these problems from someone for a client inquiry or whatever and i'm like oh my god this is gonna be fun it's gonna be a lot of time it's gonna be more expensive but it's gonna be fun you know yeah well you're gonna you're gonna figure it out versus just randomly gambling all right guys i will see you guys in my next video